So for those of you that were here last week, good morning, welcome to Denver Friends. I'm Adrian Halberstadt. <laughs> so you remember, you were actually listening to Adrian. That's good. I listened to him too, so uh, I'm not sure what he meant about having some plastic surgery done, or if that was a good thing or a bad thing, but uh, Adrian's a little taller than I am, but um, anyway, I'm glad you're here this morning. Are you glad you're here this morning? I hope so. There is a word that I'm guessing none of you have said this entire week. But we're going to say it and sing it. Boy, you're good. Somebody... I got one adult and one kid. Did you cheat? Did your mom tell you? <laughs> What's the word again? So do this. Hosanna, Hosanna. Hosanna, Hosanna. One more time. Hosanna, Hosanna. And you got to add to that. Hosanna, Hosanna. Shout unto God with a voice of praise. Shout unto God with a voice of praise. Come on, Carl, since I'm counting on you. Shout unto God with the voice of praise. Hosanna, Hosanna. Ah, just, there's not doing it for me today. So, uh, only other thing you got to do, probably most of you remember this little song, we've done it before, but is clap your hands if you don't do anything else, but it goes like this. Clap your hands, all ye people, shout unto God with the voice of triumph. Clap your hands, all ye people, shout unto God with the voice of praise. Hosanna, Hosanna, shout unto God with the voice of triumph. Praise Him, praise Him, shout unto God with the voice of praise. Then we're going to add this. You say, Hosanna, Hosanna. And then you add what it actually means which is save now. So Hosanna, save now. And then what's in the scripture, in most versions this way, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Try that one again. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So clap your hands, all ye people, shout unto God with a voice of triumph. Clap your hands, all ye people, shout unto God with a voice of praise. Hosanna, Hosanna, shout unto God with a voice of praise Him, praise Him, shout unto God with a voice of praise. Hosanna, save now. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hey, you got that part in. That's important. I saw your lips moving. Now, a little bit different here. Every kid, since this is kind of our kids portion, needs what they don't usually have in hand, which is a bulletin. So, go find a bulletin from somebody. Just go steal one. Your mom has one. Everybody needs a bulletin. You three all need bulletins. Delbert, give it up. She needs a bulletin right there. You can get it back. Yeah. We want all the kids to have a bulletin. Now, we don't have palm branches this morning, so we're going to cheat just a little. I don't know how often you notice, ever, Jan almost always puts some colorful little thing at the top, left-hand corner of the bulletin, and this week it caught my eye when I saw this laying on my desk Friday, there's these, these branches. So we're gonna let those be our palm branches, okay? And we're going to say, Hosanna, save now. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Wow, very good. If it was really hot in here, you could do your palm branches like this. Okay. A lot of us know the story, but we're going to hear it again in a child's version of uh, Palm Sunday. The story of Easter. The triumphal entry. This is Jesus. hey Who is the Son of God and the Savior of the world. While Jesus was on earth, he taught everyone about God's love and healed people from their sickness. 
He did many miracles like calming storms and even raised people from the dead. At this time, the Jewish people were celebrating a festival called Passover that had been celebrated since the time of Moses when God brought his people out of Egypt. So Jesus was going to Jerusalem to celebrate. Jesus and his disciples stopped in the town. You coming? And Jesus told two of his disciples to go on ahead of them. Eh, okay. He told them to go into a village and that they would see a young donkey that no one had ever ridden. Rock! He told them to untie it and bring it to him. If anyone asks, what are you doing? He told them to just say, the Lord needs it and will return it soon. Okay, go ahead. So the disciples did what Jesus said and brought him the donkey. A long time ago, before Jesus was even born, God had said that the Savior, the King of Israel, would come to Israel in this way. And now Jesus was doing just as God had said. The news that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem swept through the city. Many heard about all the amazing things he had done, so they cut palm branches and ran to see him. Huh? The Pharisees and religious rulers realized that there was nothing they could do, for everyone was going to see Jesus. Jesus rode into the city of Jerusalem and the crowd spread their coats on the road ahead of him. His followers began to shout and sing as they walked along, praising God for all the wonderful miracles they had seen. The Pharisees were upset. Hey, Jesus! And they told Jesus to stop the people from saying things like that. But Jesus said, if they keep quiet, the stones along the road would burst into tears. So the people kept on singing, blessings on the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Praise God in highest heaven. The entire city of Jerusalem was in an uproar as he entered, asking, who is this? And the crowds replied, it's Jesus. And Jesus rode the donkey through the street of Jerusalem to the temple in a triumphal entry just as God said he would many years before. Just a couple things while our praise team comes. Get your bulletins out again. Did you notice that they really didn't have the quote or the words, Hosanna, in this little clip? I, I thought the rest of it was worth it. And it was it just me, or did he, Jesus say that the stones would cry out? What did, it, what did he say? <laughs> Burst into tears. But actually, if you listen to it really closely, like I did three or four times, he does say they'll burst into cheers. So if we don't do it, the rocks will be glad to do it. So one more time, wave your palm branches, those pretty multicolored branches, and say, Hosanna, save now. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Amen? Amen. Would you stand with me and these folks that are up here, please?
is ever in the highest. Amen. You can be seated. Kids can follow Haley and I don't know who else. Mr. Cubby. <laughs> Ask him sometime while I call him Mr. Cubby. Goodbye. Hosanna. Save now. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And that is the one we've been singing about. Many, many mornings. I'm so thankful for our team of people that lead us in music and worship. Especially when I come here and I just think, I got nothing here. You know, personally, I, 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 I'm like you. I sometimes would just rather be somewhere else right home or something. And it feels like I don't have anything to give, and then they just pull us right in to worshiping the Lord. So I appreciate that um, from our worship team. Just take a glance at a bullet here for a second. And you should have two inserts, by the way, right? One of them says EFM Easter offering. So this is a little bit of a description about two things. The EFM offering, uh, which we'll take that next Sunday on Easter, uh, along with the, our regular offering. But any time um, before or after Easter, you're more than... Um, Welcome to contribute to that, um, which all has to do with the five-year goal that's fueled by the Luke 10 initiative. I'll let you read all that yourself. Um, but the other thing is this at the bottom of that page. Beginning on April 8th, well, that was two days ago, but you're not too late. It, it won't hurt a thing. Uh, in fact, these readings are short enough that you can just catch up real easy. Evangelical Friends Mission will be sending a daily email with a devotional for that day. If you'd like to sign up and receive those emails and pray along, you can do that at this address. I would imagine if you just type in friendsmission.com and hunt around a little bit, you'll find it. And just let them know that you want to receive the reminder or go there every day yourself. If for some reason that doesn't work for you, and you need a physical copy somehow, uh, Jan and I will both be here tomorrow. We can sure make some and get them to you tomorrow. Uh, I'd be glad to send Jan driving all over the city delivering devotionals. <laughs> but uh, I, I'm thinking most of you will make use of the, the email version. But in case that's a problem, just let us know, and, and we'd be glad to make some copies for you. Then the other thing is, uh, this coming Saturday, April 16th, 5 o'clock p.m., Potluck Easter Feast and Easter Egg Hunt. Now, I got asked a question that I couldn't answer. I, I think I answered it, but when does the Easter Egg Hunt take place? You know the answer. Boy, you were quick, Ruth. Okay. That was my answer. Halfway through. It happens halfway through. So, um, and if you'll notice in the bulletin, there's a plea there for some help to pull this off next week. And just, just look for it. It's right there somewhere. Um, the other thing we need help with is pen friends. You have until tomorrow. Is that right? Yep. April 11th. And for those of you that don't know what that is, there is a box in the foyer back there. And for, I don't know, a year and a half or so, uh, pretty much at every um, um, holiday season, people have, have written many, many cards uh, at a time, maybe a dozen or so, and put a little note in there. Didn't have no, no signing of names or anything, but just bless you if you want to sign your first name, that's fine. And, and we've been taking those to several um, care facilities where there's plenty of people who don't hear anything from anybody. And it's amazing what happens when they get this card from somebody they don't even know, and they can tell by the way it's 
delivered and written and that it's somebody who cares and is praying for them. So if you want to participate in that, um, I think Terry is responsible for getting those to the um, places this week. So Terry Simonis would be a person you might call, or call us again tomorrow if you're saying, I've got them, but where do I take them to, or how do we get them? I'd rather, uh, in fact, one, the first time we did this, I never did put my cards in the box. I was right to the day before, and I just took mine directly to the Argyle. And so uh, there's a way to get these to people before Easter so they can be blessed by an Easter greeting. Um, so that's an important one that not everyone in here this morning is aware of, and we just need your help with that. Make sure you look at those DFC directories in the back and check your information to see if it's correct um, before Jan prints those up. So I think that's all. I hope so. It's plenty. We're going to take an offering again this morning, and it's not exactly a silent offering, however there won't be any music, except the sound of your lovely voices. So here's what I'm wondering, as soon as they come and we pray over the offering, how has God spoken to you already this morning, in in a word or a sentence? Um, You know, just even something, a, a line that you sang, I wrote down, Broken lives are made whole. Broken lives are made whole, which has a little bit to do with what I want to speak about this morning. But So, come on down, guys. Come on down. Last week, it was Jim in the middle. Haven't seen John in the middle for a while. Don't stand on Jesus there, please. <laughs> I'm thinking that's an Awana thing. Yes, correct? Okay, let's pray over our offering. Father, we have plenty to praise you for. Wow. I mean, all the truths that we sang and worshiped you for because of today are plenty. You've you've already fed us pretty well today in our worship. And so, thank you for being a loving, gracious God who who loves us extravagantly, just as the scripture says. And thank you for the opportunity to love you in return. It's not just, Lord, this mental fact that we have in our brains and sometimes feel your love, but we have this privilege and we're grateful for it in countless ways as we serve you, as we live our lives in our relationships, Lord, and in our neighborhoods and at work, as we read your word and study and pray, all all these things, and as we give uh, to the work of the kingdom. Uh, Thank you for all the ways that you have uh, not just sustained uh, ministry, but kept it going strong through the sacrificial gifts of your people. So bless each and every one who gives this morning as a cheerful giver, and we will give you all the praise and glory for it all in Jesus' name. Amen. So as they're taking an offering, who's got something to share? Go ahead. Something you heard this morning. So you could just be, I'm really grateful this morning for. doesn't have to be related to the music. Oh, clear the back. I missed the first part, but I heard the worship hymn again. <laughs> Jesus is with us. Amen. Again, I repeat, so those people there, who there are still a number of people who watch and listen online. Anybody else? Word of praise. The names of God and how he reveals himself himself to us every day. (laughs) 
Well, while you're still thinking, Janet and I are thankful that you let us have a few days to go be with our kids in Kansas, kids and grandkids, and then go to Arkansas. Uh, <laughs> we were at a place called Shepherd of the uh, Ozarks, not Shepherd of the Hills. Everybody goes, oh, I've heard of that. Oh, yeah, this place is a little bit remote. I'm guessing you haven't heard of it, but it is in the Ozarks. And it's all the buildings are built into the side of mountains like this, hills. So uh, you're either going up or down in this building or, or down and up in this building and then down and up. And uh, we all got our exercise, didn't we, dear, uh, for a couple of days. It was kind of fun, actually, to see. I mean, I'm not kidding. There would be like five flights of stairs to get up to the, if you wanted to eat, you had to climb that high. It made Quaker Ridge look like nothing, trust me. The difference is, it wasn't at that altitude. So we're grateful for that. Anybody else, a word of praise? Hosanna! Hosanna. Amen. You can always count on Carl for... Try shouting that in King Supers this afternoon or tomorrow. See what you get. Okay, as we go into a time of just waiting before the Lord... Just a portion of Psalm 23. We'll get to the rest of it in a few minutes. But even just this is enough to hopefully center you during a few minutes of quietness. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. We don't have green pastures in here but you may need just a few moments to just do that very thing, to just rest in him and to, in effect, in your spirit, just lie down and let him minister to you. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul, and he leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. As we quiet ourselves before you, Lord, do all that stuff in us, we pray. Amen. I think that enough of you know the rest of this psalm, even if it's in a little bit different version. This is a new King James, so it's similar to what a lot of you have memorized. So we'll just, we'll just read through this, and then we'll just keep right on going. And however it comes out, it'll come out. I'm pretty sure God won't care um, if we have words that are a little bit dissimilar. So uh, let's just read together, and then when we're done, I really feel compelled to pray again this morning for our brothers and sisters in Ukraine and Russia. I got another uh, email to, or text, actually, uh, with a link uh, with somebody that's actually on the ground. I don't know if they're in Ukraine or, or where exactly, but it was, it's, it, it's what we talked about when this all started, you know, just for me, it's, it's hard to pray sometimes for those big, uh, big issues. I mean, I do, and we all do, but I sure can relate to, I know that there are Christian brothers and sisters in those places, and they request that we pray for them specifically all the time. Uh, what can we do? They'll tell you. Please keep praying for us in as many specific ways as you can. So with the, uh, this 23rd Psalm in mind, I'll pray and then share just a little bit. Let's, let's try together. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. You are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. 
my cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Thank you, God, that so many folks in this congregation know that by heart. They probably learned it when they were kids. Thank you for uh, just the opportunity, even, of hiding your word in our hearts. Thank you, uh, as I, we read through that and recited it, and I think about people in a place like Ukraine, and especially the believers in Russia, too, who are about to face some major persecution as they take a stand against their own government. Uh, I, it's easy to look at the psalm and just pray, Lord, may that be so for them. You know, may you prepare tables for them in the presence of their enemies. I pray that you give them all the things that are promised in, in this psalm. And we can't do a lot. You know, we can, there's some things we can do, but we've been asked many times by our fellow uh, brothers and sisters to pray for them. We don't know their names, their faces. We don't know exactly where they are, but we know that they're under a tremendous amount of pressure and, and they are taking opportunities to share the love of Christ with people uh, with the threat of persecution often. And they have plenty of ministry opportunities as they care for people who are hurt and broken and missing family members and just all the whole big mess that's, that, that's there. Yes, we do pray for leaders that they would make wise decisions. We don't need a world war, that's for sure. And we need this to stop, God. People need this to stop. I pray that you would uh, send messengers and prophets and people who speak the truth uh, in this situation. But we also pray again for the church uh, in that particular part of the world, that it would be stronger than ever. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. So let me read just one of the four versions. You already saw the kids' version. <laughs> I'd be interested to know what you noticed about that little film. I noticed the funny noses. Like, why did they draw noses like that on people? Um, and the way, of course, the people talked. That was pretty cool. But those are the kind of things that grab kids' attention, and, and that was the point, obviously. So uh, I wish we had time to read all four versions of the triumphal entry and what we call Palm Sunday. Uh, we don't. So I picked the one that had kind of the most of the things that I, I felt like were important for us to hear. And this is in Matthew chapter 21. As Jesus and the disciples approached Jerusalem, they came to the town of Bethphage on the Mount of Olives. Jesus sent two of them on ahead. Go into that village over there. And as soon as you enter it, you'll see a donkey tied there with its colt beside it. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone asks what you are doing, just say the Lord needs them. And he will immediately let uh, you take them. This took place to fulfill the prophecy that said, Tell the people of Jerusalem, look, your king is coming to you. Now, how does a king usually come? This is the point. This king, who is king of kings and lord of lords, is humble, and he's riding on a little donkey. Riding on a donkey's colt. The two disciples did as Jesus commanded. They brought the donkey and the colt to him and threw their garments over the colt, and he sat on it. And most of the crowd spread their garments on the road ahead of him, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. Jesus was in the center of the procession, and the people all around him were shouting. Praise God is another way of, sometimes Hosanna is actually translated. In my version is saying, praise God, Hosanna, saved now. They're praising him. Pray, praise God for the son of David. Blessings on the one who comes in the name of the Lord. 
Praise God in highest heaven. And the entire city of Jerusalem was in an uproar as he entered. Who is this? They asked. And the crowds replied, It's Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. Now, it isn't really funny, but it did make me smile that in the, in, in the Matthew's version of the gospel, the very next line says that Jesus entered the temple and began to drive out all the people buying and selling animals for sacrifice. In the other versions, there's kind of a little bumper in there or some other stories, but in that particular version, it just goes from that one thing to the next. So here we have this story that we're fairly familiar with, have heard and seen it several times. I have a question just for thought, and it's going to go and come pretty quickly, so you'll have to either think quickly or take it with you and contemplate this. What do you suppose Jesus was thinking about as he rode that donkey into Jerusalem? While crowds of people shouted praises, Hosanna, Hosanna, save now, waving those palm branches, taking their outer garments off and laying them on the road, spreading their garments on the road ahead of him and waving palm branches in his honor. Well, obviously, there's no way to know what he was thinking. No way to know it. But he knew what was actually coming ahead. So here he had this crowd of people who knew who he was. They were celebrating his arrival, you know, shouting praises. The Pharisees and the teachers of the law were pretty upset about it. If you read one of the other versions, it literally says this really angered them a lot because the whole city was in an uproar. And I don't know about you, but I kind of picture Jesus very calmly riding through that crowd, and, and because he was humble, uh, I, I know he did it in such a manner that you didn't feel like he was the center of attention, even though he was the center of attention. It's just this amazing scene, especially if you realize or think about the fact that he knew that in just a few days, it was going to be radically different. And people's reaction to him was going to change. And some of the same people, probably who were in one crowd shouting praises, were in the crowd at the end of the week saying, crucify him. He knew all that was ahead. So what would he, what, do you think he thought about that? I think he probably did. He knew. So kind of a follow-up question would be, well, what kept him going? What, what kept him uh, pursuing what he would, was sent for? Lots of answers to that. I'm just going to give you just one to think about today. About two months ago, I was coming into the church, and um, I came up to a stoplight, and there was this bright neon green car in front of me. Uh, in the sunshine... It really shone bright. I mean, you can tell it's kind of a neon green. And you may or may not recognize any of the insignia on there or anything like that. But I was just sitting at that light with this. I had noticed the car because I decided to turn there. And I don't normally turn there. So I had to sit right behind that car. And I had been thinking and praying about some specific uh, requests for restoration in my life, okay? Um, all the way there, up until the time I saw that little car. So I followed it. Actually, he turned, and I, I went a different way, and then I thought, I got to follow that. I got to go see what's on there. So if you know our bad, he went down Ralston Road and then turned on 58. And I went this way, and I, I eventually caught up to him. I had to go pretty quick to catch up to him. I followed him all the way to downtown Old Arvada, and he pulled in right next to the old Evangelical Friends Mission office, which kind of made me smile, too. I thought, hmm. So, I, and I, there were two guys standing in the parking lot, so I didn't want to, like, be too obvious about taking pictures of this car. What's this guy taking pictures of this? 
uh, serve pro car for? Well, it wasn't just what I saw on the back, which I'll show you again in a second, but it was what was on the side. Fire and water. Fire and water can do a lot of damage, can't they? Um, they can cause so much damage that you, you do literally have to have a restoration. You have to have a way to come in and make it as if the fire and the water were never even there. That's the key. Just like it never even happened. Fire and water, cleanup. And restoration, there's the key word, restoration. So here's the back of the vehicle again. I think this statement is true. I actually hesitated to write it this way because it's kind of limiting. This one sentence I have at the top, the, the death and resurrection of Christ, those two things together, him dying for our sins and then being raised to life to conquer death, conquered sin and death. Wow. I mean, has anybody ever come close to anything like that? No, no, you know the answer to that. This is the pinnacle of history. The conquering, the overcoming of sin, separation from God, anything you've ever thought, said, or done, the sin you were born in, all of it. He made a way for that to be forgiven. And then it gets better. He made a way for you to live forever. The death and resurrection of Christ provides redemption. Redemption literally means to buy something back, to pay a price to get something back. That's what redemption is, right? He paid with his life to redeem people. But it includes, and this list could be really, really long, what the death and resurrection of Christ uh, accomplishes and what it provides in redemption. But it certainly includes restoration. Now, if anybody in this room understands what restoration is, it would be who? Sitting on the back row next to my wife. Lee Barrera, how many vehicles have you restored? <laughs> Quite a few. I intended to have the little video. I don't think most of you have seen the video of Lee's trailer that he built with his 1940 47 truck and all those cars, that, not all of them, but just the ones he can fit on there in Nebraska, driving through uh, with the bluffs in the background. So, you know about restoration. It's, it's taking something that someone else has considered useless. It's, it's good for nothing anymore. And in the case of cars, you might as well just leave it to rot, to rust and be gone. Thankfully, uh, Lee loves cars from the 30s. Well, that's, well, that's a long time ago. That's way before I was born. These are old vehicles. Thankfully, the kind of steel they were made of, they still hang around. And he finds them, and he has an eye and a heart to bring those back to life and to some usefulness. That's one way to describe what restoration is. The other way to describe it is right there. Now, the classic definition of justification, big word that we use, it's a King James word, justification, one classic definition that helps you remember really just a part of what it means. It means a lot more than this, but it certainly means that it's just as if it never happened. You have sin and ugliness and all that stuff of life to deal with, and Jesus has the power to restore you in such a way that it is just as if it never happened. It's, he, he, he only has the power to justify us in that sense. To make what's wrong right. To make what's crooked straight. On all the rest. All the ways that you can think of to describe that. And certainly, this is one of them. I, I, I included 
Now, I don't know, if you'll notice, both the logo and this little phrase have got a, whatever you call that, they're, they're trademarked. So, but I'm pretty sure SurPro won't sue me for this, for putting that up on a screen, as it goes on the internet, because my, my advice to you is to use SurPro. There you go. I just paid for the, for the thing. I left it there because, boy, if anybody was a pro, a professional at serving, it was Jesus. And that, that's kind of dumbing things down maybe too much. But certainly, if anybody can restore what's broken and cast aside and of no use and what everybody looks at as it's seen better days, all that stuff. When it comes to uh, human beings, Jesus. And some of you in this room have some pretty amazing stories in your own life how, of where you were broken and hurt and full of sin. And a lot of things happened in that salvation experience, but certainly restoration was one of them. If that's true for you today, you need to be very thankful Amen to that? And you're going to get a chance to be thankful in the most minimal of ways. <clears throat> just quickly, a couple. Well, no, let me just go to Isaiah 50. We'll do that. I'm not going to read this. I wish we had time to read it in um, context, but that's okay. Because the meat of it is right here. So this passage in Isaiah 50, God is really talking to his people in some pretty strong terms. Um, and then it kind of goes into a prophecy or a description of the Messiah, the promised deliverer. It's one of the passages that we don't hear a lot. There's passages in Isaiah that we hear at Christmas time and Easter time. This is not necessarily one of them, but this shows the attitude and the action of the coming Messiah. Now, Messiah basically means promised or expected deliverer. And the reason why the people were so excited is they thought this is it. When he rode into Jerusalem, he's going he's to restore the kingdom. He's the deliverer. And he was the deliverer, just not in any way they imagined. They got that part wrong. <laughs> A lot of people did. <laughs> Big group, that, uh, people who get Jesus wrong. So this is a prophecy, a description of the coming Messiah, the promised deliverer, his attitude and his action. So re keep that in mind as we read it. The, the Lord God, just one more thing. Imagine, though, if uh, you've had this scripture and read it uh, long before Jesus ever showed up, and you're trying to figure out who is this? Who is this that's talking that has this, atti this attitude and these actions? Thankfully, we're on the side where we know exactly who it was. The Lord God has opened my ear, and I was not rebellious, nor did I turn away. Some people say, that place where it says, open my ear, that it's not necessarily talking about open up your ears to hear, although that's kind of the way the translation reads. But it's, some people believe it's connected to a verse in Exodus that speaks about uh, when a slave decides that you're, he's going to be connected to his master for life. It's a little tiny scripture that they go to the doorpost and take an awl and make a hole in it. Ear piercing. Before there was ear piercing, maybe, I don't know. And when I think of an awl going through my ear, I was a carpenter once, and an awl is a pretty big round thing. I would not want somebody, and they go to the doorpost because you've got to have something behind it that's solid. I imagine they put that up there, hit it with a hammer, and you've got a hole in your ear, and that says, I belong to you. So it was a step of absolute obedience and, and surrender and submission. So, the Lord God has opened my ear, and I was not rebellious, nor did I turn away. You can see why they, they sometimes connect that with that little verse in Exodus. I gave my back to those who struck me, and my cheeks to those who plucked out the beard. 
I did not hide my face from shame and spitting. We'll talk a little bit next uh, Sunday early in the service about what Jesus went through. That, that, that's a whole, just, just thinking about the physical part as well as everything else that Jesus undertook to pay for our sin. This is just a little portion of it where he says, I gave my back. Here, go ahead, strike me. And my cheeks to those who plucked out the beard didn't hide my face from the shame that he faced and the spitting. For the Lord God will help me. Therefore, I will not be disgraced. Therefore, I have set my face like a flint, and I know that I will not be ashamed. This is the little phrase that came to me at the beginning of the week, and I just kept thinking about it. And I, and I knew, I, I remembered somewhere in a song or something, him saying that he set, he set his face as flint as he went to Jerusalem. And it's a reference back to this word in Isaiah, where you see the attitude of our Savior, as well as his actions, and in some cases, lack of action. I gave myself up. How did he get through it? I asked you at the beginning. What was he thinking when he came into Jerusalem and he knew what it was going to be like in just a few days? He, he, knew, the, he knew the full weight of it. Well, the answer in tiny part is right there. I have set my face like a flint. Flint is a very hard rock, kind of rock stone. That, that, you know, that's how they make in arrows. It'll chip easy if you hit it in just right. But, it, but that little flint rock that, that, that was made into a, the end of an arrow, the point of an arrow, was, was hard enough to penetrate skin and, and bone and all the rest. So it's a, it's a hard rock. Jesus knew he had to have known this was going to be hard. This is going to be difficult. I'm going to be harder. I have to be. I will be. Now, obviously, in the garden, Lord, this is hard. Is there any way this could not happen? But I have my face. I am de I'm determined to follow through. So what was he thinking? What kept him going? We know in Hebrews 12, 2, it says that because of the joy set before him, he endured the cross, disregarding the shame. Now, it's absolutely possible because he was a man and God at the same time that he really could you could answer the question and say, I think, maybe, it's a miracle thing. He was looking down through the ages, and he was thinking about me and you by name. He, he knew we would be here, and, and I can see where that would drive him forward. I'm going to set my face like flint and accomplish what I've been called to do by my Father. Incredible. Absolutely incredible. So the first thing is this. You have every reason to be so grateful today. Aren't you glad 2,000 years ago he set his face like flint and that long before that the prophecy was given that that's exactly what he'd do and it's exactly what he did. And then the second thing, which we'll talk about next week. He's the example in all things. And the question I would ask is for you and me, where is he calling us with, in his strength? It's not our own, but it's still that kind of commitment that says, I know what God wants, and I'm going to stay the course. Because that's what he did for me. So that's later. First thing I said was, you have every reason to be thankful. Stand with me if you would, and we'll end very simply. 
And my challenge today to you would be this. I've got one, two, three, four little sentences up here. You could spend a lot of the rest of your day or tomorrow or this week finding all the ways in which you are thankful that he set his face like flint and did it. So let's read this together as our closing prayer. Thank you, Jesus, for setting your face like flint. Thank you for your loving obedience. Thank you for your commitment to follow through to the end. Thank you for all you endured and accomplished to restore my soul. He restoreth my soul. One of the things I noticed as I sat there and reread Psalm 23, it was all about what he does. <laughs> you know, he, he's the one that makes it happen. He uses people, he uses the scripture, he uses a lot of things to restore our souls. But in the end, it's him, him, the living Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you, Jesus. Bless us as we go. Thank you again for doing what was hard beyond imagine what we can imagine and seeing it through to the end for our, on our behalf, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Give us a heart full of gratitude this week, and we ask it all in your name and for your sake and for your glory. Amen.